Okay, looking good. Okay, so tell me, Robert, about uh, the three oh, different methods that you brought here today. Three different technologies over here. Is this is a hobbyist kind of machine or a very entry level machine, and it uses used deposition modeling, which basically is a strand of plastic being melted as if it were a glue gun, and then layer by layer built up. Okay, it's not expensive and it's becoming very popular. This is also a fused deposition modeling machine. It's one of many models of FDM machines made by a company called Stratasys. And this machine gets pretty accurate and does some beautiful models. And it's building out of ABS plastic, real ABS, okay? So to the, to the common person, what, uh, what does ABS, real ABS plastic mean? How far can that go in the real world? Is that, can that go beyond prototype? Well, ABS plastic is very common. It's used for many, many things. And it's strong, and it's flexible, and it's predictable. Fantastic. Okay. And the third method? Polyjet modeling. This technology is essentially an inkjet printer. And it's using an inkjet print head to spray liquid plastic uh, and the plastic is cured with UV light. And uh, the plastic is acrylic photopolymer, which means it's cured with light. And it becomes a solid. This technology is capable of extreme detail. By extreme detail, I mean less than one ten thousandth of an inch layers of plastic build the model so that virtually anything can be built, no matter how fine the detail. Oh, so you kind of contrast that with this, is, this has the most capability? This is the most capability of the three tech machines that we brought today. And is the price a little bit higher with that method? Yes, it is. Okay. Fantastic. Can I ask you now, um, what, uh, once someone's kind of made their prototype, what's the typical uh, uh, design implementation do you? I know that there's uh, well, 3D models, and is there a standardized way that uh, you yes. could just... All of the software that drives these machines is called solids-based software. Um, sometimes it's called 3D CAD. Okay. And all of that software exports a standard kind of file format called .stl. STL files make these machines work. Fantastic. And uh, is that a uh, file format that's just kind of specific to this, or that was already an existing kind it's of industry already in thing? Existence. Yes. And it's mostly a CAD format. Yes. How about uh, image visual 3D people, like you know, someone who's doing like an OBJ or something in Maya? Is that well? OBJ transferred? files can work in these machines also. Okay. My technical person can give you the the details on OBJ, but yes, that works too. Fantastic. Can I now ask you about, uh, we have some examples over here, mm -hmm. and, that's, and I think it's a salt shaker or a pepper shaker. Yep. Let's take a look at that real quick. Okay. We built these here at the show on this machine, and it's an example to show the threading that can be done with these, and the good geometry and the nice service detail. Um, and of course, if you want to use it as a salt shaker, well, by golly, you've printed yourself a bunch of salt shakers. That's fantastic. Um, Especially if you like salt. Yes. <laughs> so let's say that that was a new kind of space age, uh, just a revolutionary salt shaker. Mm -hmm. And someone wanted to take that to market. So they have the prototype now. Now, now what do they have to do? They have to get it to like a manufacturer or something. Well, that's they? a very good question. The reason why you would do your space age salt shaker as a prototype is number one to see if it works. Okay? Uh, you don't want to send it to the machine shop until you know it works because it costs a lot of money to cut metal. And it takes a long time to get your, your product back. Um, another reason is to see if everything fits together in a way that the end user will like. Also, you can take the prototype and give it to some people to try out um, without, without having to wait for the finished product. Get some feedback from the folks who might want to buy this. And finally, you can bring this to the folks who are going to make the real McCoy and ask them 
is this machinable easily? Is this a good design for you? All right, because my boss who worked as a CNC programmer for years, the guys who cut the metal, uh, has told us horror stories about the designers coming in with a new design to the shop and saying, here's our new design, make these. And the CNC folks would look at it and say, it can't be made. Or we can make it, but it'll cost a fortune to make this, so go back and redesign it. Well, avoid all those mistakes, all right? Try to get it right the first time with prototypes. Nice. So that uh, relationship then, uh, beyond what you guys are doing here to a manufacturer, do you guys have relationships with those people or do you just kind of like hand your customers off to some suggested uh, CNC type people or well, they... We try to make customers out of design shops and manufacturers by introducing this technology in their environment to have them bring it in-house. We also are a service bureau. We can provide services for them, for them to try this out for a while. Oh, fantastic. So those are perhaps this, your, your main customer then? is, is, is the... main, Absolutely. Designers, okay. engineers, and manufacturers. Fantastic. So um, I'm, well, I'm going to ask one more question about bridging the gap between designers and manufacturers. Because okay. I find that, you know, manufacturers really know their trade and their skill. And they just, you know, wait for the designs to come in. Designers think about designs, and as you say, there's a little bit of trial and error, and and they don't really know about manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys help bridge that gap, or how does a designer um, get interfaced with the with the manufacturer? It's a great question, and this is all called collaboration, and it happens automatically when the designers bring the prototypes to the manufacturers. Uh, of the CNC guys, the guys who are going to make it, and get the kind of feedback that we just talked about. Can this be made? Can this be made reasonably priced so that it can be sold? If not, what has to be changed in the design? Collaboration happens when you use prototypes. Fantastic. Can you just give us an example of uh, just some, some interesting uh, customers you've had? that uh, are, are, you know, aren't necessarily manufacturers, but designers that have brought some designs that have kind of gone through the process that you just think are like worth, worth, worth mentioning. You know, well, we've got the salt shaker example here, but well, this, something that went to the real world. The real world. Well, I have a lot of customers who are government designers, and, uh, you know, what they care about is, is fit and functionality, okay? They want to be sure it's going to work. Um, I guess that's the best example I can think of. And so, so they're just dealing with an end product that's like part of a larger machinery, like a, uh, a, a car, a plane, or yeah, a, a tank. tank or something? That's okay. right. Great. Uh, it certainly would be embarrassing to sell something to the United States government and then have the uh, folks bring it over to the tank to see if it plugs into the in input spot and it doesn't fit. <laughs> sure. And I, I assume now, just to kind of where this technology is going on that point, that this has been so revolutionary. I mean, everybody's probably, I'm sure mm -hmm. I can just imagine well, adapting to it or... Well, you know, it, I forgot to mention, there are people who use the output from these machines as the actual product, not just as the prototype. Hmm. Um, there were some write-ups in the trade press recently about UAVs. And the UAVs are simple aircraft, and some of the key parts are now just being printed, not machined, hmm. on this kind of technology. It's very cheap to do it that way, and it's very fast to do it that way. Sure. Okay, and also, the third area this is taking place in is called rapid tooling. Rapid tooling is typically mold making, okay? Molds are used to make thousands of something. You take the mold, you cut it, the mold rather, you take it and you fill it with plastic one after the other. What happens if you want to make only a hundred of something out of plastic in an injection molding environment? Well, why not print the mold on this kind of machine? Because the machine shop is going to take two weeks to cut the mold. Mm -hmm. And using this, you'll have to mold overnight. All right? So, and those products are used as the end product. And so there's probably a limit then to the durability of that mold, and that's why about 100 would work? Or well, normally... there is a limit to the durability. There's no way of saying exactly how many it can make. But the way to look at this is short to medium run. 
not long run. Okay? Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot. I really uh, think this is enlightening. And uh, I'm just going to uh, roll the camera here. Looks like we have a piece that's in the machine right now. And could you just tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here? You are seeing the machine putting down layers of liquid plastic, building a model. And uh, again, this machine conceptually, very simply, is, an ink, is, is, is a glue gun. And you know, if you've ever used a glue gun, you know that there's a bead of glue that comes out. And instead of glue, this is plastic. And this is the FDM process, fused deposition modeling, meaning the liquid plastic, as it cools, glues to the layer under it. And so everything uh, that we see, there's really, there's no curing needed with this method. Correct. Once it's done, it's ready to go. That is correct. The only thing one does is there's something called support material where there's overhanging features. And that system puts down a support kind of plastic to deal with that issue and one just takes the model and puts it into a warm bath of water and a little bit of acrylic solution and the support material dissolves away. Fantastic. And what would uh, just uh, say if someone came and wanted to do a salt shaker like we had in our hand there? Yep. What's what's the price on that going to be just like in roughly? materials? Yeah. Maybe five bucks. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye bye.